with no further ado, I'd like to introduce now my colleague, Kate Mendes-Silvey, who is Pref Professor of Cultural Geography at University of Exeter, uh, who will be uh, giving us a presentation on risk, relinqu relinquishment, regeneration, narrative choices in heritage climate research. And Hannah will pass now to Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, thank you, Rodney. I think I'm live. Um, yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, as Rodney mentioned, um, I'm a professor of cultural geography and I'm based at the University of Exeter in Cornwall. Um, so the image that you're looking at here is actually a few miles from where I'm sitting. This is Mullion Harbour on the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall, just to place myself. Um, you can see a landslip in the foreground. Um, so. What I want to talk about today is a sort of series of projects that I've been involved with with various collaborators over the last 10 years around this theme, but I wanted to begin by just talking about the pathway that I'm going to explore, which is a path that lies through narrative and language. Um, so action through the way that we frame stories about what's happening to our climate um, and what happened to it in the past and what might happen to it in the future. The specific question that um, I was asked to speak to, I've actually reframed. Um, the question was posed as what can heritage research contribute towards characterizing and qualifying climate related risks? And so I'm expanding and uh, reorienting the question in this talk to talk about um, what can heritage research contribute towards comprehending and contextualizing climate related risks and opportunities? Um, and I want to explore the space that arts and humanities research particularly can open up to help us see differently and understand different contexts, uh, some of the historical and cultural contexts that might allow us to comprehend the risks that we face in a deep and engaged way that might complement some of the sort of scientific understanding about climate change and climate futures. Um, I think this question of comprehension is actually really important because um, it's difficult actually to track what's going on with our climate futures at the moment. Um, I think we're all probably overloaded with information. This is a couple of headlines and reports that came out in the last week or so. Um, and I think it's pretty clear now that actually we are in that climate change future already. So you have, you know, February in the UK was the wettest on record. Um, May the driest, um, you have record flooding um, around the world, you have the heat wave that happened in Siberia, you also have an increasing recognition of the links between climate change and the inequality of various kinds and racism and there's a sense I think of trying to figure out how we're going to navigate into this future in a way that allows us to act ethically and I think heritage is part of that. I think the key thing here is the change that's happening, the effects are not evenly distributed. So we're looking at um, the effects falling most heavily on people who are already coping with inequality and injustice. And I think, as I, I should probably say this at the very beginning, I think where it's possible for us to work to prevent catastrophic ecological and climate collapse by reducing emissions, we should do that. Um, but I think we also need to accept that a certain degree of change is now unavoidable and we need to be prepared to respond to that. Um, before COVID hit, I went through this sort of strange season of consuming climate collapse nonfiction. Um, so my stack of books, Losing Earth a Decade, We Could Have Stopped Climate Change, The Uninhabitable Earth. And I think what I was trying to do was trying to just come to terms with the knowledge that it's now officially too late, that in the three decades of my adult life, although we've been aware of the effects of um, our emissions, we have missed every opportunity to switch tack and slow that. And I think, if anything, the crisis over the last few months has taught us that we can actually respond to a crisis when we need to, which I guess should be reassuring, but also that our powers of normalization and coping are really considerable, and I actually think that should probably frighten us. <laughs> um, and one thing that David Wallace Wells points out in his book about what we might be looking at in a climate changed future is that one way we might manage to navigate that path until he's talking about sort of four or five degrees. Um, of warming. One way we might navigate to that path without crumbling collectively in despair is perversely to normalize climate suffering at the same pace as we accelerate it, as we have so much human pain over centuries so that we are always coming to terms with what is just ahead of us 
decrying what lies beyond that and forgetting all that we had ever said about the absolute moral unacceptability of the conditions of the world we are passing through in the present tense. And I think we are in probably occupying that space already. So heritage research, <laughs> what can we do? Um, so, as I said, a lot of my work actually is um, is about is about narrative. It's about recognizing that the stories that we tell matter, and it matters what stories tell stories. This is actually on the board in the room I'm sitting in, and it was created as part of an AHRC project on repair by Nick Hand um, on his bicycle printing press. Um, for those of you who know Nick, um, I think that the key thing that we need to appreciate is that we can call it heritage triage um, is now is now necessary. We really can't save everything. Um, and so we are going to need to find ways of navigating loss and transformative change to heritage, ways that are adaptive and not defensive. And there's been a lot of work on this and some of those people are with us today. Um, and I think actually, I, I think there is a moral imperative here that if we can find more, less resource intensive ways of coping with change, <laughs> then we can channel limited resources and energy to the people and places who will need it most. Um, and in the UK, I think quite often actually the stakes are relatively low. Um, we, you know, we have coastal heritage that is at risk, but um, whole cultures and communities, um, aside from perhaps a few places, are really not at risk. Um, so I think finding new narratives is actually a way of trying to move into the future in a way that allows us to more equitably respond to the challenges that we're going to face. Um, and a lot of the work that I've done over the last decade sort of fits into this space, um, and most of it was funded by the AHRC. It's been produced in collaboration with a number of different partners. Um, and so through those projects, I've been trying to figure out what strategies we might need to develop, what narratives we need for accommodating heritage transformation, finding value in change when change is inevitable or unavoidable. Um, and the first project that I've flagged here was actually a project with the National Trust um, called Anticipatory History, and it stemmed from some work that I'd done at Mullion, looking at how to story the history of what looks like a timeless harbor, you know, Little Cornish Harbor, but actually has a real history of dynamism and change geologically and also materially, and trying to say we need to tell our histories differently so that we can understand that dynamism as being fundamental to their identity and that that might help us move into the future um, and embrace that change as part of the continuity of place, actually. Um, and that produced a little book called Anticipatory History. Simon Naylor was the PI on the network that we created. Um, and then the other term that I've sort of been playing with and trying to create new language to describe um, is what a, a sort of approach which is sometimes described in heritage practice as managed decline, which is a sort of reluctantly accepting that things change, things decay, there's you know, gradual disintegration and deterioration. And so I wrote a book trying to play with the idea of actually what might happen if we accept those processes as positive and generative um, and curate that decay. Um, and then following on from that work, um, we're actually overlapping. Um, I was involved in Rodney's Heritage Futures Project, um, leading a work package on transformation um, and trying to think about landscapes where there was some significant change happening um, and ha trying to understand that transformation transformative process is actually again part of the, the sort of narrative and um, continuity of that place and not at a disruption or a, um, a, a break with the past and so these um, the heritage futures book was coming out imminently I think um, and so at the moment, um, I'm just going to put up some more terms, which I think might help us think in this space um, before I tell you about some current projects. So the word risk, I think um, it's useful, it's necessary, um, but I do think it's probably worth at this point, you know, balancing it with trying to understand what opportunities may emerge through um, a, a situation where there's some risk or threat, you know, and there's a lot of heritage research on how the specter of risk or um, endangerment actually produces a certain kind of value as well um, and engenders the impulse to save, um, but it can also generate other kinds of connection and other sets of values. Um, the other term that we we use, um, you know, there will be loss, and I think that's 
that's clear. We need to accept that. Um, but sometimes that loss can actually release value as things transform and they um, move into other kinds of perhaps get drawn into other ecological systems or provide the opportunity for new forms to emerge. Um, and the term sort of disintegration decline, you can understand also there's always a counter somewhere in there um, and that as something disintegrates, it becomes available either energetically or sort of materially to, to be picked up by other systems. And so there can be regeneration. Um, this is an idea we played with in relation to the rewilding of a landscape in the Coa Valley in Portugal on the Heritage Futures Project where the, there had been a sort of hollowing out of an agricultural landscape and community but they were rewilding this um, river landscape. And what that allowed was actually a connection to a much deeper past where there was a, there was a record in rock art of human animal histories and connections that they were re, um, rethinking and embracing as part of that deeper um, historical connection um, and the land, emerging landscape identity in that place. Um, and I think the other term that it's useful to think with, you know, we, we, we recognize that there will be some retreat, which is going to be necessary as we cope with sea level rise. But I think the concept of um, relinquishment is quite useful in that space. And this is one that's come up. Jem Bendel uses it in his deep adaptation um, paper that he wrote where he talks about relinquishment as the intentional letting go of certain assets, behaviors, and beliefs where retaining them could make matters worse. I think it's quite useful to think about whether there could be a sort of gifting or recognition that we are going to let go because actually the sort of the, the defensive impulses doesn't actually, it's not productive in that space. Um, and the images that we've been having seeing in the background here, this is the Orford Nest Lighthouse, which actually um, very significant moment last week where they started to dismantle it. But this is, um, this is a really fascinating place because in a sense it sort of encompasses all these ideas that has been there has been both a recognition of risk and there have been opportunities that have been generated by that as the community gradually um, recognized the loss of this structure and generated rituals, ceremonies, and opera to celebrate its passing. Um, the image uh, next to the BBC News screen grab is actually Kate Lonsdale, who we'll hear from later. Um, and Kate and I visited Orford Ness in 2012 as part of a follow-on from the Anticipatory Histories Project. So she's there talking to Grant Dale. And if you look at the compare the two photos, Kate's actually standing on land, which is actually in midair, I think, at this point as they dismantle that lighthouse. Um, so it's just a really fascinating place to think about these options, these choices that we have, um, because there also was a sort of last minute attempt by a private owner to move in and de defend the structure, but a recognition that eventually we would need to say goodbye to it. And that was actually partly, um, that was recognized by the new owner, but there was a sense that there needed to be an interval of holding on before the letting go could happen. So really fascinating. Um, okay, I think I only have a few more minutes. I'm just gonna tell you about a couple of active projects. Um, this next one. Again, here we are in Cornwall. This is um, a, um, a bit from our shoreline management plan where all the areas in green are no active intervention. It's, a, it's not really thought of as an incredibly dynamic landscape, but it is changing quite rapidly um, and, and more rapidly than it has been. Um, and at the moment, um, Hannah Fluck and I with Historic England and also Brian Yonsel um, here at Exeter are co-supervising a PhD um, where Tanya Venture, who I think is with us today, is working in this very dynamic landscape to create um, resources that might help us understand archeological change and loss in this landscape, but really understand the different kinds of loss that we might be talking about and be specific about, are we talking about total loss? Are we talking about partial loss? Are we talking about loss of something which we didn't even know existed as you are here, you're looking at an image of a, um, a, a cliff castle here on that headland that almost nobody who visits this beach even knows exists, but will definitely be lost. So Tanya's work in that area will engage both with some um, practitioners and policymakers and with the local residents to try to just encourage dialogue about loss um, in a productive way and in a sort of more plural way. Um, okay, so my ding, that's okay, I'm almost done. And the other project um, is actually trying to work in this space where it's one thing to talk about being more open to new narratives and thinking about embracing change, but actually it can be really difficult to implement that in practice. And so Rodney and I are working on a Heritage Futures follow-on at the moment, again with Hannah and with um, Rosemary Hales, 
Ingrid Samuel and Harold Fredheim. Um, this is a sort of National Trust and Historic England are co-eyes on the project, not partners. Um, and we're trying to bottom out whether or not current policy in England allows you to manage for transformative change. And if it, if it does, how we can um, make decisions that are better informed by that um, policy or identify areas where we need to communicate more clearly about what those options might be. Um, and I think other people are going to talk about this today. So just briefly, one of the things we're looking at is how when climate change adaptation from the natural environment, there seems to be more openness to recognizing that that kind of loss can be, or change can create opportunities. Um, and I think that's an interesting resonance for us to explore. This is just a uh, heads up about a project that I think we need more projects like this one. This was an amazing project where they actually linked Kiribati um, with places in the UK and looked at climate change comparatively and sort of compassionately across different geographical sites. Um, and then finally, I think Navin will talk about this, but I think what's most inspiring to me is that a lot of the most interesting stuff in this area has not necessarily been done by academics, but by collaborations and by groups like the Climate Heritage Network, um, where there's some really fascinating um, thinking emerging about how we will move into the future. Uh, informed by the past. Just to close, these are the projects that I mentioned and the um, various, if I wasn't the PI, I've noted who, the, who that person was. And I think it's been exciting to see the HRC sort of invest in, in this area um, and really validate the need for this kind of research. So that's me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Caitlin. Um